my real kind of burning passion is trying to put male infertility on the agenda and that's why I was delighted to accept this invitation and I hope this does start a conversation. I think one of the things that you said earlier on was you know we talk a lot to kids in school and so on about contraception we're so paranoid about not getting pregnant we don't counter that with a message about fertility awareness. Science. Science. Technology. Technology. Medicine. Medicine. Health. Health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health, answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes. A tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimey Abraham. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground, but we're going to end with listener questions. And this is from our male listeners. So we've got quite a few, not too many, six, six questions. And, and yeah, it's going to be very interesting. So question number one, how to get your, how do you get your sperm count? Yeah, so good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. If we did, we'd be in a much stronger position than we currently are now. But we've already talked about what we think might negatively affect sperm in terms of this oxidative stress. And I guess that's one of the reasons I wanted to cover it a bit. So if you think about, there's lots of things that we do inadvertently to ourselves in terms of exposures in our life that might affect your sperm count. So if you smoke, you should definitely stop smoking. If you drink a lot of alcohol, heavy alcohol binging, then you should cut right down so I would say sort of four or five units of alcohol per week not much more than that there's things like you know being very overweight obesity and so on but also then what you eat the diet that you eat so fruit and vegetables are good remember we talked about vitamin c vitamin e carotenoids and so on so fresh fruit and vegetables are good for boosting your sperm count so a healthy balanced diet not drinking too much alcohol caffeine is a really interesting one because there's sort of two schools of thought one of which is a bit of caffeine is probably quite good certainly if you add pure caffeine to sperm in a in a lab environment not in the body then you can boost how sperm swim a bit but so you might say well I'll drink more coffee that would be great or you know but I'm not sure whether we know that that's definitely the case so three or four cups of tea or coffee a day is probably about right I think we also know that the type of caffeine and whether it's mixed with sugar is important and the reason I mention that is because and there are other products out here but Red Bull is the one that springs to mind immediately but something that's really loaded with caffeine and a lot of sugar is not not good for your sperm count. So if you're drinking a lot of these type of energy drinks, you might want to think about switching that around and subbing in something else instead. Some orange juice, something heavy with vitamin C might be better for you. But it's not an easy one. Uh, I guess, you know, the other things that kind of their old wives tales are not, your scrotum, you know, has the testicles in it. It sits outside the body because the testicles ideally should be slightly cooler than, than our organs inside our body. So thinking about then what makes your balls hotter. So if you sit a lot of the time, like if you're in a, an office job or if you're in the library studying a lot then sit with your legs apart rather than sitting with your legs crossed it's all about scrotal temperature you know as we come into winter heated seats really nice pleasure if you're driving to work and it's really cold and frosty an hour sitting on a heated seat will raise your scrotal temperature by one degree c now your scrotum is supposed to be at 1.5 degree c lower so that's not good. I'm not saying sit on a heated seat. I'm just saying, you know, put it on for a little bit, but turn it off. Don't, you know, if you're driving around all day for a job, don't be sitting on a heated seat. Similarly, there's thoughts about, you know, wearing tight underwear, looser is better, not having saunas, hot baths and so on. I mean, all of these things are in mod- moderation. So, you know, if you fancy going to the sauna once in a while, why not? I don't think it's going to make a big difference. If you're in there hours and hours and hours on end, day by day, not a great idea. The last thing to say is that I think a lot of guys, when you're thinking about your body and and kind of exercising lots is that I am also really kind of paranoid, I guess, about uh, supplements. So there's a lot of build up supplements, recovery shakes, and so on. Now, there's a lot of really great stuff out there, but sometimes, probably about up to 20%, I think they estimate, of these kind of supplements that you can buy either online or elsewhere, they may have testosterone or steroid like testosterone derived supplements within those ingredients. And the reason that that's important, remember, I said how testosterone is really 
important for building sperm. If you take testosterone, you stop your body producing its own testosterone. If you take testosterone, that doesn't give your testicles the signal, but your body stops producing it, which does give your testicles the signal. So you end up knocking the sperm count off. So have a look at what supplements you're taking. Be really cautious. Anything that sort of ends with an arone or something like that, where it kind of, you know, it's testosterone or something. Just Google it, look it up, check and see what it is, because it may be having some sort of inadvertent effect on your fertility that you're not. Amazing. You've answered three questions, actually, with the next question, which was how does smoking affect your sperm if it does, which is sort of answered in terms of it does affect the sperm and then there was another question about what would I what I'd like to get is any practical advice to ensure my lifestyle protects my sperm something beyond don't smoke don't drink and stuff but you've gone into that in greater detail maybe just to elaborate on how smoking affects the yeah I mean I don't think we absolutely know how it affects the sperm I think oxidative stress is the kind of key component there because smoking has all these sort of noxious chemicals that are you know in their own right pollutants but so on a my micro level in terms of the testicular environment the sperm are being produced in it creates a much more hostile environment and therefore the the reactive oxygen species these high energy molecules can attack the sperm damage the dna damage the sperm membrane the sperm doesn't have a lot of capability to defend itself remember how it's got not a lot of cytoplasm and so on so they're very vulnerable and because of the way that the sperm needs to swim and flip its tail it's got lots and lots of lipid lots and lots of fat in that membrane and that means that it's also very to damage because the oxidative stress damages the lipids so that's about as much as I can tell you really about smoking but if you're a smoker give up it's great for your personal health to give up it's great for your reproductive health Mm, thank you for that now this next question when I initially got it the saw it I was like I don't understand but I did a little bit of research so the question is what are the effects of mint on sperm and I thought why are they asking this anyway I did a little bit of research and I found a a paper which was evaluation of possible toxic effects of spearmint on the reproductive system fertility and number of offspring in adult male rats so is there an effect of mint spare mint on sperm what are your thoughts I, I, I don't interesting question I think it's fair to say I don't know it's not a compound that's on my hit list of people advice when I'm talking to patients or guys about their sperm count I did read the paper I was quite intrigued by it so this is quite a classic kind of study and you could have substituted anything other than spearmint in there you could have substituted caffeine alcohol you know some sort of nicotine derivative whatever so the idea is you've got sperm from from an animal model and you add some sort of compound to the sperm in a in a jar or in the lab or whatever and you can't see how well they're swimming or otherwise and actually it looks like if you add really high levels of, of mint extract that actually the sperm count a sperm sorry swimming seems to go down a little bit but not to the point where it's terribly significant and doesn't seem to have an impact on it now the reason it's interesting and guess goes back to this cat spur channel so this cat spur channel that we talked about before that's really really important for the way that sperm swim is different in mice and rats that that's the first thing to say. So that experiment in rats might give you an idea of what might happen in human sperm, but we don't know for sure because, as I say, rats and mice are different. But it gives you know, given that you know, you'll probably be familiar with this concept of mammals, although we're all very different to looking, have a remarkable amount of genetic similarity, and therefore a lot of cellular pathways and so on are remarkably similar between cells from different species. But specifically for sperm this is a difference particularly with how cat spur responds so i don't know couldn't find anything about adding sperm into human sperm so that's maybe a a thing to explore another day on the other hand there are lots of papers that are published that have looked at adding various other compounds to sperm and so one of the classics that came out a few years ago was about adding sunscreen and various other things to sperm and see what it does Mm. so there's this concept of you know endocrine disruptors is the sort of the global term for it but concept of a chemical that's in the environment that you might be exposed to that you might eat or you know plants that grow around us or whatever that might if you added it directly to sperm in the lab might have some sort of impact interestingly i think you know the much more interesting question with this would be if my wife girlfriend fiance is eating mint what happens then because i think there's such an inter that we acknowledge but we don't understand between the female and the, the sperm and i think that's you know that's the bigger question that we don't know the answer to but so ultimately in terms of sort of general health advice if you like chewing gum if you want to eat spearmint if you want to make a mojito or a no heat not a problem but on the on the other hand you know that you know one question you can answer 10 more i could 
create in terms of what, what next. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I, as you were talking about animal models, I, that was actually something on my mind that I went into, which was what's the best animal model for the, the, the human model, human sperm model to animal sperm count. That might make, that's not the right way of wording it. I got very confused about the question. <laughs> because I didn't even say it right. So, I mean, what, if you wanted to, if you couldn't get access to human sperm, which animal sperm would be the best would have the best correlation even though I feel like it's very easy to get access to human sperm but I, I may be wrong well, no I, I, I'm with you on the getting I guess it is easy to get hold of, of human sperm obviously you need to have medical ethics and you know kind of research governance in place but you know we have guys that are undergraduate postgraduate students members of staff who we pay them 20 pounds per ejaculate and they'll bring a sperm sample for us to to do sort of you know experiments on you know the the rules are it's only used for experiments you can't possibly use it to fertilize anyone it certainly isn't used for treatment we can't freeze and store it so it's just you know whatever experiment on but but yeah we 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 pay them for uh, contributions to science alternatively as i say i work in an ivf clinic and we will ask patients that are having semen analysis or patients that are having treatment look you know we want the best part of your sperm sample for treatment but if there's leftovers it would normally be just kind of discarded or thrown away would you give it to research and they don't get paid they do it for you know and most guys will will donate their leftovers so i guess the kind of i'll edit it out that's right question i guess is if you can get hold of human sperm why on earth would you look at a human model a yeah human model? That's one of the things I thought with that paper. I thought if you're testing against rat sperm, surely it's harder to get rat sperm than human sperm, in my opinion. But what do I know? I guess I, I as, as a clinician, I would say, yes, I, I would totally agree. But I, I guess it just depends what sort of system and, and kind right. of research program you've got in place. But for me, it would, yeah, I think experimenting on animals, that's a different question. David. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. OK, two more questions. What is a healthy amount? What is a healthy amount of sperm that one should have? And I, I'm, I'm going to whoever submitted this question. Thank Thank you. I'm going to also add because I'm not sure whether they meant sperm as in the sperm count or also because there was another question around volume of semen. So what's a healthy amount of volume and what's a healthy amount of sperm? Yeah. yeah. So a good question. And I think we can probably tackle both of them very easily. So a healthy sperm count, 16 million per mil or greater. OK, so that's an easy question. As I say, if you have less sperm than that, absolutely sterile. It's just it's going to be statistically speaking less easy to get pregnant in terms of then a sperm or seminal volume ejaculate volume then we would recommend sort of one and a half mils or greater and there's a huge variety of of, of a range of that i think the important things to say is that the sperm is the, the it takes up a tiny volume but is obviously the, the important characteristic of the ejaculate so if you have more ejaculate it doesn't necessarily mean there's more sperm there it usually means that there's more secretion seminal plasma prostatic secretions and so on so then the kind of converse of that is well if you have a really low volume ejaculate that might indicate a problem it might indicate a problem with your prostate it might indicate a problem with other sort of secretions from the from the genital tract and so it would be worthwhile knowing about that because there may be sort of infections and so on that would be worthwhile getting tested. Mm, interesting, because I'm, I'm wondering, again, probably the wrong correlation. But as, as a as a woman, you know, you know, you know, with your period, oh, it's a bit heavy this month. It's but you know, you can sort of say, oh, it's a bit late because I'm stressed. You know, there's sort of things that you navigate and you know if something is wrong just based on you just know it's a bit different this month and, and so forth. So I guess men may notice that something is different with their ejaculate volume or things like that but then may not necessarily take that other step to get checked out you know may just be oh there's a volume change or this is how I usually am or this is a change but may not take that next step to say yeah oh Um, I totally agree the other only thing to say is in terms of quality if that's the right way if you notice any sort of blood staining in semen then go and get checked yes yes okay and last question from our listeners is masturbating healthy to ensure you have healthy sperm a question that I then further ask (laughs) somebody which is I and I I think there's been a I don't know if I'm if I'm wording this right but a sort of narrative that masturbating regularly if not having regular sex is a good way to keep the the sperm factory going basically so is it 
is, is masturbating healthy to ensure better quality of sperm being yeah i think it probably is so i mean sperm production is continuous it's a continuous pipeline of 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 sperm production happening over and over and over again it takes about 72 days to build a sperm from start to finish so you know sort of talking about sort of two or three months is if you're focusing on changing your lifestyle you might expect to see a difference in two or three months time so it's quite a slow process so masturbating more or less often won't change that production won't increase the production won't make a difference to that the best analogy I can probably come up with is one I use in clinic a bit which is if you're in the supermarket and somebody on the shopping trolley is putting stuff onto the conveyor belt at a constant rate that's the analogy of producing sperm all the time if you don't then take the parcels off the other end of the conveyor belt then everything starts to kind of build up and the bits at the bottom get a bit squashed and a bit crushed so the idea being that if you don't masturbate or if you don't have sex and if you're not you know if you have a longer interval before you then produce a sample you might have a bigger volume but bigger is not better and actually the sperm quality of the cells themselves will be poorer on the other hand if you've got somebody that's constantly putting on the parcels on the other end of the conveyor belt and you're taking them off too all you're going to have is less parcels so if you masturbate too often or if you're having sex every single day when you're trying to conceive your sperm count will be dropped so we say two to five days two or three times a week is the sort of you know kind of healthy kind of middles at ground for there for a couple trying to conceive now clearly you might want to masturbate for other reasons and that's absolutely fine is it healthy to masturbate of course it is if you're health if you're concentrating on masturbating for keeping healthy sperm then two or three times a week i have one question and then that will go on to concluding comments it's interesting to me that there is such a high large sperm count so you said 60 million per mil that signifies a you know sort of quote unquote a good amount but I think somebody listening to that would be thinking but there's so many sperm and one egg why do you need so many why does that um, why do you need so many sperm because if ultimately you just require one in the end why is that there's such a need for such a large number of high quantity or amount of sperm? Yeah, great question. I'd like to ask that to somebody else myself. I think, again, we just don't know. We know that in an average ejaculate is 100, 200 million cells. And ultimately, you just need one to get to an egg. If you look at that journey from the ejaculate onwards, you know, only a few thousand will even make it to the fallopian tube. And as I say, only, you know, a few hundred will make it to the egg. And then there's obviously a kind of natural selection, a kind of sort of, you know, race, you know, there's always this perception of the best sperm wins the day. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but certainly the most capable sperm will fertilize the egg if it gets there. But there's a lot of wastage along the way. And I think, you know, it's incredible, isn't it? Why, why would there be so many sperm produced? And yet you only need one. Is there some sort of selection process don't really know but there must be. Dr Sarah Martins de Silva I could speak to you for so long because this is such a fascinating <laughs> topic and just your your explanation of everything is 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 so palatable and easy to understand and thank you so much it means a lot to have you on Monday Science because this is a topic that we've really been trying to get someone to come and talk about and go into such detail as you have so I am extremely grateful and I'm sure our listeners are extremely grateful as well I'd just like to ask if you have any key take-home messages any concluding comments and if so please share them with us I don't think so I I I guess my real kind of burning passion is trying to put male infertility on the agenda and that's why I was delighted to accept this invitation and I hope this does start a conversation I think one of the things that you said earlier on was you know we talk a lot to kids in school and so on about contraception we're so paranoid about not getting pregnant we don't counter that with a message about fertility awareness and and so on so that would be my lasting kind of legacy would be can we change that and I think starting from you know education and and a message from from youth up is, is is probably the most powerful way to do that but putting male infertility on the agenda You've been listening to the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. We hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show, and we hope you had fun along the way. We know we did. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on our website at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com. Shoot us an email at info at mondaysciencepodcast.com. Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science. And access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.